What's up, everybody? Welcome into day three. Three, three. This is the third day of the EXP Expo. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure how I'm still sitting up, but I'm joined by right now Miss Jen King, the commander, the person held responsible. Uh, she is here. We are gonna we just wanted to give you guys a minute while we're uh just before we get started here. With the gang from Red 5, we have Alex DeLuca and Josh Starnes coming on in just a second from Red 5 Comics to talk about their stuff. But we wanted to give you guys a little preview of today's schedule and the schedule for the week, right? Uh, it's weird to have everything, like this is like so jam-packed. But then we roll into something really amazing, which is our normal programming. Right. Our regular programming is going to be a good time. I mean, and it's 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 weird because my role in this thing is, you know, like this weekend has largely been to be talent, to be here, to be interviewing people. But then starting tomorrow, I'm the guy who, uh, as I said on Facebook, makes the donuts. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm producing uh, almost every show or every show. And, you know, I'm the guy who's pressing the buttons all the time. So it, it's kind of an interesting transition to me to kind of play in both worlds. Uh, and tomorrow night is a prime example of that, right? So our Tuesday night shows go like this, guys. It's uh, 6 o'clock from 6 to 7. It's me with my new show, The Pull List, where we talk about what's on my pull list that's coming out this week and what you should be adding to yours. And then we have Minute to Skim It with Miss Jen and Hannah, uh, a long-running show that you guys have been doing for how long? I, we need to go back and look at all of the feed, but I think five or six years now we've been doing it. It was really janky at the beginning, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we've been we've been adding we've been adding tech to it. We've been making it better, and making it better, and making it better. And uh, you know, now we're debuting on network uh, on Tuesday uh, from seven to seven forty-five. Uh, and the reason we do it that way is because at se at eight o'clock you have uh, a show on the Comic Book Shopping Network where people have a chance to pre-order the books that are up. Excuse me, out this week. Um, so at 7.45, I'll be back for a couple minutes, and we'll just talk about some of the great places you can go buy comic books, um, local comic shops, that kind of thing. And then at 8 o'clock, uh, we have uh, In Stores This Week with Nick, uh, which will be, you know, myself, and uh, or I'll be a part of it a little bit. Uh, Good Moo, Rob, uh, I know you meant morning, I saw, but I think Good Moo is way more our style. I think so. Um, so we're going to go with it. But um, yeah, so then it, it'll be Nick, uh, Nick and I or Nick and some special guests talking to you about more books that are coming out uh, in stores on Wednesday. Guys, our whole goal on Tuesday night is to drive you into your local comic book shop on Wednesday. You know, we, we're here to support the direct market. We're here to support publishers. We're here to support creators. And the best way to do that is going into a store on a Wednesday. Or whatever day you can go in. I'm not saying you got to be a Wednesday warrior. But whatever day you can make it in, going into a comic shop and buying comics. Like My, my suggestion is to come to the that show night, on Tuesday show night, with a pad and pen. So you can write down all the things you heard that you absolutely must have. They sell these like at Walgreens. You could buy six of them for like four bucks. Yep. Yeah. And by the end of the year, you might be through one of them. So you've got six years worth of writing your comic list down for $4 at the Walgreens, is all I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, the other things we have, we have a bunch of great people on today. Like, we're still doing the EXP Expo. It's not over yet. Most conventions, you'd be like, all right, I got to go home on Monday. No, it's Martin Luther King Day. Happy Martin Luther King Day, everybody. So hopefully you've all got the day off work. Because the banks are closed. And if the banks are closed and the mail doesn't go, I don't work. That's kind of been my rule. So I'm hanging out with you guys. So hopefully you've got the day off from work or you're watching us at work. I won't tell your boss, I promise. Keep the volume low. <laughs> well, here, here's a little trick, right? Open up a Google Drive, a Google Sheets document in another tab. And when you hear the boss coming, just click on it and start typing as fast as you can. I may or may not have some experience in this regard, you know, with March Madness and other things. So try that. Do your work gets done. Do your work, please. Make your bosses. Yeah, don't get fired. But like, <laughs> don't try too hard today. 
So we're uh, we've got right now uh, coming up in just a second uh, the gang from Red Five. Like I said, Alex DeLuca and Josh Starnes. Uh, we've got uh, later on in the day we've got Second Sight Publishing. <coughs> um, then Jen gets to interview someone she's recently become hooked on, Twisted the band. They have a comic book out called Haunted Ions. <coughs> they will be here. Excuse me. And then Source Point Press. Travis McIntyre will be here a little later. And then following them a little later in the day, even Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor will be here. Uh, and then uh, we round out the day tonight. You're going to want to tune in at 9 o'clock tonight, East Coast time. 9 p.m. tonight, East Coast time. For the Comic Book Shopping Experience Team AMA. So we'll have everybody here who's involved in this little uh this this madness that we're starting and you'll be able to ask us all your pertinent questions all your impertinent questions and just randomness that you'd like to ask us and we will answer it because that's how those things work so you're going to want to tune in for that tonight at nine but right now we've got uh alex and josh from red uh red five comics uh who every time i i read one of their books or think about it i hear simply red in the background because Red 5 has some amazing books, but the first one I ever read uh, was, I can't remember the name of the title, but it was a red cover with a plane. And yeah. that was the first, huh? That's, that's The Rift. The Rift, yes. Mm -hmm. And so ever since then, that's just the way my brain works, is it connects it to a song, and then I can always remember what the cover looked like. I'll, I'll get better at the titles. So we will be back with them in just about 15 seconds. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hello, my friends. How are you doing this early morning? Hey, good morning. Hey, Jen. How are you? I'm doing so good. good. I still have my voice, which is saying something. I was going to add together how many hours <laughs> of interviews I've done over the last two days, and then I said, no, that'll just, I'll wait till I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the experience. Uh, have you been talking for two days straight? We're joined by Alex DeLuca at the very top. Hello. Hello. Darns. Uh, I wish Alex lived closer to me because I'm sure we would all hang out more. But Josh lives locally to me, and I get to have the honor of hosting him on some of my shows. About once a month, he'll come by and and uh, show us the cool, fancy things, which is so, so much fun. Uh, those are great shows. So let's get into the weeds here. This is um, Red Five is an amazing company. I really love carrying them as a retailer um when was red five born so red five red five was born we are now a little over 10 years old we come on on uh yeah 13 years old so red five was born in the mid 2000s the first book um hit the stands in the fall of 2007 but it was actually born years before that uh by uh, two guys that I had known for a while. And, and I, I was there when they were having their initial conversation to put it together, Scott and, um, and, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and his good friend, Paul. And um, they had, they had known each other through uh, Star Wars fans for a long, long time. No surprise, Red Five Comics uh, was named uh, from something from Star Wars. And uh, they had known each other since college and they had, uh, and, and Paul, had actually been working at Lucasfilm for uh, for an extended period of time, and he uh, he had been he was preparing to leave, and he had always wanted to. He'd been doing like some web comics for them, but he always wanted to branch out and do uh, do his own larger comics and and get them into comic stores and see them created. And um, Scott had wanted to do the same, so they. Um, uh, they spent basically two years talking about it, and I'm kind of within all of those those email change and pitching out ideas and, and talking about things that can be done. And um, finally, in in um, the spring of 2007, they actually started to get uh, their first books made. The very first book we ever came out, which is still one of my favorites, is a book called Neozoic, uh, a world a world of dinosaurs where no um, 
no, uh, 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 dinosaurs did not go extinct and they evolved up alongside mankind and live in these giant wall cities and uh, have professional dinosaur fighters. So that, that finally came out in the fall of 2007, the very first Paul, Paul Inns. And that was, uh, that was his baby that he'd been, he'd been working on for a long time. And, uh, uh, and then that was quickly followed by our, our first batch of, of books, um, as Scott's first title, Afterburn. Uh, which one day soon, hopefully, we will see on, on big screens around us. And then uh, our first big hit, um, Atomic Robo, where we, we sort of by accident got hooked up with uh, Kevin Jack. He'd been doing 8-bit theater for several years. And uh, he had a book that he actually wanted to do on shelves and had been and had been taking it from publisher to publisher. And somehow all the other publishers had said no, but uh, but we said yes. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was kind of an amazing first year. Um, we, within like six months, um, uh, an agent from CAA had called and wanted to really liked Afterburn and wanted to, to buy the rights for it. And then, you know, a couple of months after that, we got the news that, uh, the first Atomic Robo, uh, limited series had been nominated for an Eisner for, for best hit series. So, and then we won the, uh, the Diamond Jim Award for publisher of the year in our first year. We're like, this is amazing. This, this, uh, this publishing thing, this comic publishing thing is way easier than I thought it was. <laughs> you just have to show up with good material and, this, and great things happen. And then, uh, then it turned out to be actually quite a bit more difficult than that. But um, uh, I had been um, sort of working, uh, working with them, <laughs> a lot of logistics and, um, and connecting them with, uh, with um, other comics artists who had books to pitch from, from the inception. And then about uh, 2015, I decided to make my role official so I, I joined. I, I, I took an ownership interest, and uh, and joined as one of the uh, co-publishers in 2015. Feels like yesterday, but it's now six years ago I came on board. Here we are, still uh, still going strong. So Joshua, how did the how did the uh, the founders meet each other? Did they just meet over dinner at a con, or did they they live close to each other, or just like each other's work? How did that start? They lived close to, they so uh, uh, like Paul and Scott. I know had had uh, met in college, so they they went to college and they quite kind of had bonded over um, over their shared love of Star Wars. So even when uh, even when Paul moved to California, they stayed in touch. And then I met Scott through a friend. Of, he he was my best friend's best friend <laughs> growing up. So uh, it was sort of like um, somewhere along the line, and, and my best friend is a, a man who named uh, Phil Malone, who um, I have known since high school. And just, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's hard. I don't know if you can actually like even pinpoint exactly where it was. Just sort of somewhere within the realm of knowing someone for thirty years, I became acquainted with his circle of friends because it's just hard not to when you're around all the time. Uh, so I had met Scott. You know, by the time, um, by the time. Red Five started getting talked about. I had known Scott for probably um, six or seven years, um, and we also we we traveled in a lot of the same circles, um, a lot of the same comic book circles, and a lot of the same movie circles. So when I'm not uh, when I, I'm not getting a chance to write comics and um, and publish comics, I'm also a professional film critic. Um, so there was a, a long period of about 14 years where I wrote um, movie reviews and um, and features for a website called um, a coming soon diet and um, Scott also wrote for that same website um, focusing heavily on on um, Star Wars news and genre news and sci-fi news that was that was sort of his corner and I, I wrote up the weirder small independent films just pretty much what I do and um, but we got to know each other uh, well well then and we actually you know we, we started to form our own friendship from from having a go between and so um, you know by the time Scott, uh, was starting to have the, these uh, initial discussions about forming Red Five. I, I'd known him for five five years, and as soon as he said, "You know, I'm about to start a comic company," I'm like, "I want to be a part of that because uh, I've been I've been a comic fan and comic collector, and in, in, in one in one area or another, worked it for most. I mean, I've been a collector since I was a boy. I worked in in retail um, all through college and, and into my mid twenties, and uh, and um, had when I was a teenager some uh some some ambition to like self-publish my own comic one day if i could get around the fact that i, I can't draw at all 
um, without really having, you know, having, you know, a 15 year old's idea of how hard that would actually be. Um, and then, uh, but it's always in the back of my head. So as soon as, um, as soon as uh, uh, someone I, I knew well, I was, uh, I was saying, you know, we're going to start a comic company. I was like, I, my way in, and I pestered him um, relentlessly um, with my ideas for the company for for a decade until he finally was like, all right, you know, we might as well might as well make the fish as you won't need to learn about it. Um, but especially once I, you know, once I saw the first books come back from the printer and and, uh, you could, and saw even before that, saw uh, the art and saw the care they were taking, you know, they have always been committed to, though we're small, has always been committed to uh, to really high quality work and um, trying to to make the slickest and, and best looking presentation we can. So we you know, have too many eggs in our basket, but the eggs we have are big and giant and multicolored and shiny and fantastic. And that's kind of the way we like it. As a retailer, I would tell you that's been to your advantage. It's a, a big benefit to not have a bunch of things to crowd the rack that you're not sure what to focus on. Things coming out in a, a slower pace makes it very easy to say, well, this is Red Fly's focus right now on these couple, two, three books. And it makes it uh, much more simple to say, I'm dedicating this much rack space so they get face out time, which is always so much better when you're trying to sell comic books. Comic books with just the top showing are much harder to sell, in my opinion. <laughs> so um, it sounds like you had a very early on interest from Hollywood in some of your properties. Yeah. Um, was that part of the the um, the forward looking focus that you guys had, or was that just something that happened magically? It it I will I want to say kind of it happened man. It was it was definitely not a thought. At first, during during the initial discussions, it was more about let's just make some comics and put them on stands. But then it happened so quickly that it then you know it, it happened almost um, almost simultaneously with the first books going out. That then it did start to be something where that was that was being thought about. And I think because it happened so fast, I think we thought it was easier than it was going to be. What happened was you know with those first books, you know um, we. Um, did not yet have national distribution, so we were uh, um, writing to a lot of, uh, emailing a lot of comic stores and retailers, and that we put our put our books on their counter or work out some sort of deal to be on consignment or see if they wanted to buy direct from us, who they had never heard of and didn't know what we were pitching them. Um, and we, you know, we were doing that for probably three or four months before we actually got national distribution, and um, and we. We did get picked up by you know a couple of uh, the larger shops in that um, go now and, and meltdown. You know, RIP. Uh, we're both willing to kind of carry our stuff um, on their shelves. And uh, an agent from CAA just walked into. I think he walked into meltdown and he saw. He's like, "This looks really interesting. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to find out how to get in contact with uh, the people that made it because I think I can make a move." So it's just like we were just minding our own business and we got the the call and. Um, and like six months later, Afterburn was sold, and yeah, and we were kind of like, "This is this is a this is amazingly easy. You just put out a great, you know, a great product, and and we'll be banging down your door. You don't even have to do." And uh, <laughs> I wish that were true, but it, you know, ever since then, we're like, "All right, we have to, we have to, you know, we weren't keeping this in mind before, but we have to to keep it out." <laughs> exactly, Alex. <laughs> I'm sure. No. I, um, but um, uh, and you know you it's it's a part of the it, it, that was you know you're talking about like 2007 obviously their comic at that point had been big you had Spider-Man films and the X-Men films but you know you're about a year before Marvel started its unstoppable juggernaut and people were just studios really just started going God we're gonna buy every comic you know thing we can find because somewhere in there is our next major franchise but it wasn't you know too long after that that it was it started to become like regularly what do you have what do you have what do you have and we were you know having to go and um and shop around and and we've been lucky that uh, we've had a, a lot of good titles and quite a few um have been been picked up and, and have uh had interest shown on them and uh 
And it's always something we're thinking about now because uh, especially for a small publisher, you, you can't not. It's not the only, it is not the only thing I think of when I'm looking at a new book. Um, I, I tell that when I'm looking at a new comic that, that we're talking about, my first thought is always, you know, does it work as a book first? And I want it to be a good comic that you can just sit down and read. But obviously you can't, you can't ignore the other part because that part of the business and um, and something that's got a really good good chance of, of getting picked up is something that we also always want to talk about. And, and I'm up front with everybody that we talk with. Like, you know, this I think is a good comic book, um, uh, but it's, it's, you know, specific to comic books. And those are the kind of comic, a lot of those are the kind of comics I like. You know, I love Grant Morrison comics. They're, they would probably never translate into a movie and that's someone who writes stuff that works um, very much entirely within the medium of comics and isn't really translatable outside of it. And, uh, and I always love, you know, and I'm always looking for books like that as well as looking for, uh, for books that have some sort of crossover potential. Cast a wide net. So um, it hasn't been that long since you guys were kind of like new to the scene. Speak to the audience a little bit about what it looks like when you first start a company. What are the steps to like, if you wanted to become distributed nationally through not like a diamond kind of distributorship. What kind of ducks do you need to have in a row to be even considered? So we, to start with, we really, and, and, you know, first I, first thing you do is do your homework. Like when we first, uh, by the time we, um, actually had printed our first book, a lot of uh, phone calls and emails had gone back and forth, both with retailers, um, but also with Diamond to discuss like, what's it going to, because I think definitely there was a thought for sure, it was like, oh, well you just present, you know, three issues of the book to Diamond and they distribute it. And no, <laughs> it is not like that. Um, but uh, so there, but you know, we definitely spent some time doing homework, um, finding out not just like uh, finding out, yes, what, what's selling and what's selling in, in different parts of the country. Because if you call enough and talk with enough retailers and man, for the most part, most of the, you know, we have a, we have, have a long um, contact list that we spent a while building of, of different shops. Um, I spent a, a good long time just building a spreadsheet of, of comic store phone numbers and addresses. And most of them would, were way of a call with us. Um, but having conversations with them about what they carried in their stores and, you know, what their customers bought, and you, you can get like a real sense, especially graphically. Um, uh, there are parts of the country where, like only Marvel and DC sells and you're like, all right, so my stuff has no chance there. And there's parts of the country where, um, you know, mostly it's small stuff. Um, and you got to, we're having phone calls with, with Diamond. I mean, we're, we're basically asking point blank, what does it take to get into into the diamond catalog? How, do, how can we get distributed by diamond into two stores? And they were very upfront about that. Like we want to see this, we want to see that. We want to see, have a catalog with com completed titles, no vaporware that's going to disappear, but that you have, have interest from stores already, um, probably that you can, one to one to stores already, and you can show us how many copies you have been selling, so that we have some idea whether it is actually worth it for us to uh, to carry you in our, our web house or not, our, our warehouse or not. Um, you know, we are talking that, that indication of what what price and costs are like, so you start to get find out what the actual. Okay. Have any idea what that means, or kind of what's involved? What what you are likely to get paid for an individual copy of a of a comic you sell, and who you sell it to? What it's likely to each individual one of those one of those books. Um, so you know, do your research way in advance of so doing that. We spent months and months um, talking with Diamond, talking for. Or, um, per, uh, per thousand copies and, uh, you know, uh, figuring out, um, what payment terms were, how we could work out payment terms, figuring out how to finance both the creation of the books and, um, and their production of what, um, 
implementing numbers, we Joshua, do me a favor, uh, pop back off, pop, pop off and then rejoin us. Uh, your Wi-Fi is totally giving you a hard time. And I bet you if you do, if you do that, it'll work better. Uh, Alex, what's going on, man? It looks like you're t coming to us from a uh, the back back hallway of some awesome menu, uh, music venue. <laughs> it is my home office. I mean... You know, I like I like to I like to say I'm glad my wife does the finances because if I did the finances, our house would be broke, but we'd have a lot of cool guitars and comics. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said, but that might be okay too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I think it would be. <laughs> so, Alex, um, uh, I know you from your work on the Dragon Whisperer, which is awesome. Thank and you. What is so hilarious to me right now is that with you with the rush hat on looks way less like your internet icon self which looks like you come from the movie somewhere in time <laughs> a very period piece so it's just it's mind-blowing to me i'm like going every time i see you and i see you in a different hat i'm like going alex is a man of many faces he can be anything <laughs> and many hats too apparently <laughs> thank you thank you yeah like uh you know that I, that, that picture you're talking about is uh another kind of a, a musical endeavor that I'm in. So yes, I love the music and I love the comics. So let's talk about the music first because it is front and center in the back. It's obvious that either you like just collect the look of, of uh, musical instruments or you actually a musician. What do you play and when do you start? I, um, I play guitar and I sing and I've been playing in bands forever. Uh, when did I start? <laughs> 19... Norm and um, decades, decades have been doing it. I've been in bands ever since, and I've been very blessed. I've actually been in, in bands that, uh, if if uh, I, I like to say, if I were single and if I was, I was okay living in like you know a closet, I could have like just been a musician. But um, no, I've, I've been in bands for for many many years. I'm I'm in a band now. Obviously, live performance is is. Uh, completely stopped um for the most part for now but uh before that i was i was gigging at least about once a week at, at restaurants and bars and, and that kind of thing and uh i have a children's music group the ray tones that uh that's my 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 joy and passion uh, we, we we're kind of like i like to say if, if the wiggles are the beatles we're the stones we're kind of edgy children's music you know um so we do that and it's it's a good bit of fun and you know and both comics and and music are i i bleed comics and music it's just who i am to the marrow of my bones right so you're in a band but were you a band kid was i oh a band kid in school no i wasn't actually i didn't i didn't know no band stuff in school um i don't know maybe because i was too rebellious but when i wanted to there was no guitar in any of the bands and i just wanted to really focus on guitar because you know why guys start playing guitar i mean because to get chicks so so um and i said well there's no there's no band there's no guitar in school band so i guess i can't do that so but then you know i i took i took the sort of route of like being in in school in in bands with friends that i was in school with so Technically, I was in bands at school with friends, so that kind of makes it school band, right? Yeah. 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 You're, you're a band kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is uh, music part of your, your family growing up, or is it something you just found on your own with friends? No, definitely. My dad was a singer. My dad was a singer um, in Argentina. My, my parents are from Italy, and then they were then they spent a lot of time in Argentina before they moved to the States. And my dad was a singer in the 50s in Argentina. I mean, I wish I knew him when uh, he was that. Like, he's a different man. He had this the, the cool hair and the suits. And, you know, you know the look of, of the black and white pictures from people in the 50s? Like, and he had that cool big sure microphone that you hold like this. And he used to croon to the girls. And, and you know, when I was a kid, my dad said, girls, Alex, girls used to chase me. I'm like, no way. Just no. 
and then you know, and then I see pictures of him. It's like, oh my gosh! And like, you know, my wife looks at him. Like, Why wow, your dad is way cooler than you? I'm like, yeah, you know, it's you know, it, it's like that. So it was definitely in my uh, and my brother. He's a absolutely fantastic singer, great guitar player too. It is absolutely um, in my family. Yes, I was raised around music all the time. That is so cool! Oh my gosh! So did you um, did you do like the typical garage band where you just like rolled up the garage door and got to go with your pals and and rocked it out? Oh yeah, um, boy! At the in, in the early days, uh, we rehearsed so much more than we ever gigged. And they they said like we used to say, you know, rehearsal is good, but there's not a lot of money in it. Um, and yes, and we the neighbors just loved us and the cops too on occasion at the parties um yes many 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 hours of rehearsal and it, it's kind of it's kind of good i mean it's good to put in a lot of hours of rehearsal at the beginning it's very good one one thing i learned um and i always remember this it was an interview with ruth rose and joshua will know who ruth rose is i'm quite sure she actually she wrote uh the, the, she wrote really the, the, the script of King Kong, the original, in 1933. And then, um, and she said, one thing that writers, and it was much later in life, one thing that writers aren't, don't want to do, or filmmakers don't want to do, is start at the bottom. You got to start at the bottom. And I always remembered that. I said, yeah, that sucks, but okay, I'll start at the bottom. Because, you know, where else am I going to be? I mean, I'm not going to like be Eddie Van Halen, you know, the first moment I pick up a guitar. So, so I start at the bottom. I said, okay, guys, we're going to get together. We're going to rehearse. And we're going to rehearse a lot. And we're going to get our parts right. And, you know, let's, let's, let's learn covers first. And, you know, one good thing about being into Rush is that if you, you learn good technique pretty quick because Rush is, you know, is, is the technical music. So we rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. And then later in life, getting gigs became a little bit easier because I was well rehearsed. And then after a while, I was getting enough gigs in which, I was looking for opportunities that there was no rehearsal. There was just the gig. And what that means was you show up at the gig. You, well, you, you, you get a song list at the beginning of that. And then, you know, and then sometimes at gigs, especially at the restaurants where we're sitting down and it's casual and we're at a bar, it's not like we're not the show. We're more background music. We can actually have our, our sheet music in front of us and, and look at it a little bit and glance at it. But you get to the point in which you're, um, rehearsed enough beforehand with the other musicians you can look at each other says okay we're going to do this this is going to be you know a one three four five or there's going to be a 12 bar blues and e a shuffle and we have no idea what we're going to do and then the the guy that sings it or the lady that sings it goes two three four and then you start so that's how that's how uh it, the, that's the point that i got to it was really great so i was looking at opportunities in which uh, we said, well, we rehearse four times a month and we gig about once every six months. I'm like, mm, no thanks. Uh, well, we gig about four times a month and we rehearse once, a really long rehearsal. Good. I like that. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. Well, maybe not. I haven't gigged in a while, so I have to pr probably like practice again. Yeah. Yeah. But do you remember um, how you got your first gig? Um. Yeah, let's see. My first gig that was outside of, I played talent shows in high school and stuff like that. But my, I remember my first gig was uh, when, when, when you're young, when you're a young musician, you think the music that you write is going to be so much better than anything that anybody's ever heard of the covers that they know. Because you don't want to hear the Beatles. You want to hear Alex DeLuca's original that I wrote in my bedroom last week, but it's really good. And I got these musicians that, that are going to play with me. So at the beginning, so our first gig, we played at uh, like a, 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 uh, a bar, um, but it was like a restaurant bar because we weren't under, we weren't 18 yet. So it was, it was all that. It wasn't technically a bar. It was the fourth street grill in downtown San Jose. And we're just like we're gonna do just originals, man. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be playing for the man. And um, I'll tell you I'll tell you how it went in something that somebody told me many years later. When I play at restaurants, it's all covers. It's stuff 
everybody knows. And then this one guy came up to me and said, you know what I love about your music? That you didn't say this. I went to a, a street fair the other day, and somebody was playing, someone who I never saw before, says, this is from my fourth album, and I won, and, and then I walked away, because I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear somebody playing like an original, and that's how the audience reacted. They're like, mm. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they bobbed their head a few times at some things, but but mostly like, okay, so I said, all right, you know, doing some covers is good. I'll, I'll ease into doing originals. And with my children's music group, it's all originals. And um, the nice thing about a children's music group is your audience sort of um, uh, renews itself every seven years or so. I mean, a, a small child is only going to be is only going to be into your music for a given amount of time. And then you have like a whole new audience just in a few years. And what's good about that is I haven't had a new CD in a long time. And, uh, but what is, what does a, a one-year-old care about that or a, a two-year-old care about that? I mean, it, to them, it's new. It's like, if you hadn't heard the Beatles before, your the Beatles are new for you. So, and that's the one wonderful thing about playing children's music. And also they kind of don't care about the tune itself. As long as it's catchy and you're bouncing around and you're happy and you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're getting the parents into it too. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about playing children's music. It's, it's uh, the shows are short because the attention span is short, but by the end of a show, I want to collapse because I'm just, I'm just the whole time. I'm like happy and bouncing around and doing stuff and just getting really goofy. And we have a costume character performer and we have hula hoops and we toss a beach ball in the audience. We're like, go to the, the raytones.com and you'll see videos of us um, doing that. Uh, it's, it's good fun. So what is, what is the favorite song with the kids? What, what is the one they like just get up and lose their minds over? Unquestionably. It's... <laughs> Daddy's scratchy face. <laughs> it's called dead because you know. Let's face it. I I mean, it's seven in the morning here. It's it's seven thirty in the morning, and you know, you, I could I could sharpen a pencil on this, and you know, and and um and Josh too. I I've never seen Josh without stubble. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's like that's it's yeah. like dad. It's like, and then we we do a dance where uh, we tell the kids to do this. <laughs> And then the kids get up and they do the scratchy face dance. So kids love goofy. Kids love kids love gross. It's it's funny as it sounds. Kids love gross. Anybody with a kid know that that kids love gross. We have a song called Smelly Socks. And um and you know, Daddy Scratchy Face and other other fun songs, hula hoop songs, a beach song, songs about pajamas, just all kinds of goofy stuff. Uh, and you know, the educational ones too, like mm -hmm. counting and traffic lights and signals and all that. Yeah, whenever I've got teenage boys now, but still, if I want to see them cheer up, like if they're having a day, mm -hmm. I, I put on, um, I think there's like a, a kid's radio station just on like Sirius XM or something. Right. But they often have this song, you probably know it. Uh, it's about a duck and it's called Got Any Grapes. <laughs> <laughs> that's adorable that's adorable yeah you know it's it's true it you know there, there there is a certain thing that it's a certain thing about kids music that brings out the kid in us and we're always going to remember you know my, my my son was in his bassinet i was changing his diapers and he was singing row 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 your boat you know yep. yeah it probably helps keep you young too if you have to like go on stage and start thinking like a kiddo <laughs> It keeps me young to a fault. In fact, it keeps me only young. That's like, I mean, forget this maturity stuff. I mean, it's, it just, it very much keeps me young. Yeah, I think, I think as comic book people, that's kind of like the universal fact that I found out about us is that we do feel like little kids inside. We're just holding on to that with both hands and don't want to let that part go. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to let it go for as long as I live. I'm going to be a complete goofball, you know? Mm -hmm. What was your first comic growing up? Do you remember it? My first comic um, was Chamber of Chills. And it, it was, uh, I remember it. Well, my, my brother, my brother's eight years older than I am. So he was into comics and therefore I was into comics. He was into Star Trek and then I was into Star Trek because everything that he did, I, I glommed onto. So I was actually fortunate to, uh, to get into this stuff very early and, and at a very young age. 
I I loved King Kong. King Kong was it for me when I was a kid. I mean, when um, and and uh, I'm I'll, I'll I'll date myself, but when I was a little kid, it was before the 1976 King Kong came out. So for me, it was the 1933 King Kong, and that was Fay Ray. yeah, Fay Ray, Bruce Cabot, Robert Armstrong, all of them. Um, and I just loved King Kong, and I remember I saw this issue of Chamber of Chills in which this giant gorilla man was on the cover. I'm like, oh, that, that's King Kong-esque. So I want to get that. And then, you know, my, my brother, he was into, the, he was into him. Definitely. He was, he was the Captain America, the, the, the Batman and all throughout the young life. It was, it was the superhero books. It was Chamber of Chills first. I remember that, but I remember then the, then the superhero books and, you know, I, I ran the gamut. I, everybody was my favorite um, for the longest time. Spider-Man, of course, the Hulk, Black Panther, um, all of those were, were my favorites uh, at a very young age, and then and then later and then later I got into the the non superhero books, and I kind of been going that route for thirty years at least, if not more. Yeah. So were you, were you the kid that kept your books meticulous, or were they just like in giant piles all over the corners of the room, center of the floor? When I was uh, a little kid. It was that. It was like I would roll them up, stick them in my pocket, that kind of thing. But then, <clears throat> um, around the time of Jim Shooter of Marvel, mm -hmm. I to me to me, yes, eight, 1986 was the the big year. Okay, of course, that was the big year where where everything changed for everybody not just me everything changed for everybody but for me before then when jim shooter was the editor-in-chief of marvel to me that was like there was a real shift in what what these comics could do and and the storytelling and the, the writers and the artists um i didn't i cared less about who the writer was before jim shooter but then jim shooter happened I'm like oh you know okay this guy christopher claremont he's he's really good and um all the writers and then after that then bags and boards probably started a, a little bit before then but i don't think they really completely took off until at least for me and the time around the early 80s when jim shooter started and then then that was it it's like there was good, fine mint, pristine mint, and and therein was my world. And then you know, these books, these these these, there's stacks of long boxes here, and you know, they're all in there. And yep, I've read them, and yep, I'm gonna keep them, and that's where they're gonna stay, in their nice, not quite temperature controlled environment, but uh, you know, in their bags and boards. So now now that's what I do. I don't read with a pair of tweezers, but I, uh, I, uh, I still keep them like that. Got a question from our audience here. How excited are you about Kong versus Godzilla coming out this year from Legendary Pictures? I am. I'm like a girl at a Beatles concert. I I want to scream and then faint. Um, that's how excited I am. And unfortunately, good question. Unfortunately, it's called Godzilla versus Kong, and usually the first okay. name is the good guy. Um, I am a King Kong fan. King yeah. Kong, I do like Godzilla. Yep. There was there was you know a a a, a deleted line from Pulp Fiction when uh, Uma Thurman asked John Travolta, "says Are you a Beatles man or are you an Elvis man?" And he says, "Well, tell me the difference." Well, a Beatles man can like Elvis, and an Elvis man can like the Beatles, but you're only one. I'm a King Kong guy. I like Godzilla. I love Godzilla, but I'm a King Kong man. So super yeah, I, excited. I, I wonder how they're going to address this. I, I've heard rumors that, that they're going to speak to different powers that the Skull Island has afforded Kong that we haven't seen yet. But uh, the fact that they had shown us the atomic breath for Godzilla seemed to make this fight a very disparate fight. So I'm hoping that we haven't seen something that Kong's got. Mm -hmm. That will even up that part of the fight. I I do think. I mean, they're they're gonna they're gonna. Um, I think that. Well, <clears throat> it's. Have, have you seen Have you seen the, the the toy leak? It's been out. It's been out for a long time. No, I've not. Well, there's there's a toy in which Kong has a huge weapon. Okay. And and a, a, you know a, a bludgeoning weapon. Mm -hmm. And. Um, that would work. 
Yeah, that would work. But the th and and there's there's other things. I think that there there's going to be other monsters, and I think they're going to team up and beat the other monsters. The, the 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 filmmaker said there is a definitive winner, but he doesn't say between Kong and Godzilla there's a definitive winner. Well, he says there is there is a definitive winner, right, Josh? You heard that too. And I'm I'm okay with that as long as uh, I heard. heard. Oh, I heard that. What I heard was was third hand. Listed was like something. Think more like Batman v Superman, where you know they're like. They're fighting each other for a while until a larger menace appears, and then they and then that's what the actual end of the movie is. That's what I've heard. So. Yeah, that's I that's what I want. It. I kind of want. I'd like to see it. Uh, although I, I'll be watching from my going to. But. Yeah, that that's that's I wanna, what I want. I don't want to be surprised when I see it. <laughs> right. I don't want to. I don't want a winner between Godzilla and Kong, um, because it would because. I'd feel better. Like the, uh, you don't want to like original one where I think God. No, 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 no. Godzilla did not win in the original Godzilla version. Where no, like they that. both they both fight and they both end up underwater and then only Kong emerges. That's but I, mean. I haven't seen thirty years. Right, but but the, but the implication is because okay. since Godzilla is also also amphibious. Godzilla just swam away, you know, and they both were like, ah, oh, the, the heck with this. I'm getting out of here. And they, you know, and that's what happened. But they both emerge in the water and only Kong comes out. So to seven year old Alex, King Kong wins. But, uh, you know, okay. older, mature Alex, it's like, okay, they realized that fighting wasn't the answer at the end there. And then Godzilla swims away and King Kong comes out of the water. I always kind of think of those two creatures as like mm -hmm. the typical like male rivalries where they will fight. The, there doesn't need to be a true winner, just a territory drawn. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I, I like how I like how you put that. Mm. Tokyo's mine. New York's yours. It's all right. good. Okay. Good. Yeah, we're all good. You know, th this town is big enough for I'm the two. Have skull all right. So let's talk about Dragon Whisperer. I just popped up. One of your biggest fans is uh john p's son <laughs> oh my gosh he's been wonderful he has been wonderful he has he and his son have done reviews for dragon whisper video reviews this dad is like he wins the dad award because he like i don't know if you said you saw his like birthday that he was preparing for his son i mean it was a comic extravaganza i sent him posters for dragon whisperer um they've been wonderful and and uh, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. That that just keeps us going when we hear about, especially kids, liking it. You know, it's like there's there's hope, and it makes us feel good. And you know, kids kids are the, the most uh, honest critics, as we all know. All especially us parents. I mean, they like something, they like it. But if they don't, forget it. And you know, they'll just they'll go on to the next thing. So that was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear that. I love seeing. Uh john with his son i just see him pouring into his son um he gives him time which is what every kid really craves it doesn't matter what the time is doing but the, he, he gives him that time and he's pouring into him the love of reading and of the medium of comic books he's he's doing dad right oh yeah mm -hmm. definitely definitely hey thanks john thanks <laughs> I just saw I just saw a team team Gamera, that was pretty sure. funny. Yeah, there we go. See team Gamera. So he's like, you know, I forget this Godzilla Kong stuff. I love Gamera. <laughs> there, there are some some uh, some really cool kaiju we haven't got to see yet. That um, they they can spread this out for a long time and have them reveal. But yeah, there's some there's some really crazy uh, figures that I've collected over the years. And I'm like, you know, when's Jet Jaguar show up? And <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about Dragon Whisper. Right. Is Dragon Whisper the first comic book that you created, or do you have a long history in creation? It is actually my the first comic book of my creation that has been published. Yes, I have written other comics here and there um, throughout the decades, but Dragon Whisper is my first creator-owned 
comic that, that I wrote, and I also lettered it, um, there was there was a very small door that opened for me to a bigger world that I'm going to thank Jimmy Robinson, Jimmy Robinson of Bomb Queen, Jimmy Robinson of um, The Empty, Jimmy Robinson of Cyberzone. In the early 90s, all of us, we all went when uh, Comic Con was a lot smaller, we all hung out, and I wanted to write comics. And Jimmy and Jimmy said, "Do you want to write an issue of Cyberzone?" I'm like, "Yeah," and and um, it was the one and only time another creator ever ever did anything on a Jimmy Robinson book. Jimmy Robinson's an auteur; he does everything: write, pencil, ink, color, and letters, everything. And it was the only time he ever did it. And I wrote one issue, and. Um, and, and because Jimmy Robinson later went into like bigger and better things, I mean, you know, uh, image comics, and he wrote a Wolverine series for Marvel, that one door, I, th the amount of mileage I was able to get off that one thing um, got me into Comic Con every year. And so thank you, Jimmy Robinson. Thank you for that opportunity. I, I owe you everything in, in comics. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have this conversation. But Dragon Whisper is my, my first creator owned. Uh, book that um, is is mine and um, how it started. It started as a different incarnation in about 2007, and then uh, it was very different. It it wasn't steampunk. It was much more Treasure Island ish, and, um, and then I submitted it here and there, and I just got a few nibbles. Um, and then one company was just on the verge. Says, We're going to have a meeting about it, and, says, and it's a pass. I'm like, all right. So then. That lapsed, and then in, tw in 2017, I saw those pages again. I was I want to, I want to revive this, but I want to completely make it different. So I had like five sample pages, and what I did was I changed the story around it. And because these are all Treasure Island, and they look more uh, classics illustrated, I made that sequence a flashback sequence of hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and then. Um, I wrote around it, so I completely changed the characters. I changed a lot of things. I made it a steampunk thing, and um, I like steampunk. I, I'm uh, I'm not in that world or the subculture, but I think it's beautiful, and um, so I decided to make it that. I made the character uh, a young woman. That was a young boy at the beginning in 2007, but I made it a young woman. I made her ethnically diverse because um, I'm only one ethnicity. I'm Italian. My parents are from Italy. Um, I'm just I'm just Italian, and uh, while I'm very happy and proud of that, I've always been sort of envious about people saying, "Oh, I'm a mix. I have this. I have a little bit of of Native American in me. I have a little bit of African in me. I have a little bit of Japanese in me." I've I've always been so interested in people with such a mix in their in their blood they can call on so many cultures of who they were so that's i wrote a character that that had that that was that was a mix and um and then i went on uh deviant art and then i uh i looked i looked at my parameters and then i got a couple hits of, of two artists that i like and i emailed them both and the artist that got back to me first was glenn fernandez and i said do you want to make a comic? I'll pay you. Writers, if you want to do a comic and you can't draw, find an artist and pay them. End of story. End of story. You will get the best results. Um, I found the artist and, and we hit it off. And, um, and I knew that submitting the more material that a publisher had, the better the chances. So I had five good pages and I submitted. And a lot of publishers said, it's good. Can I see a little bit more? I'm like, mm, that gets expensive, but okay. Then I finished, I said, okay, I'm just gonna go nuts. I finished an entire issue. And then I submitted to publishers and I got a lot of bites. I got a lot of bites and I was very blessed to be able to pick and choose. And the way I met the guys at Red Five, was at conventions. I saw their table, and you know, if, if if what Red Five really knows how to make a good presentation, their booth was great. They they knew how to lay things out. They had the posters right. They had the books laying out perfectly. There was they they, they epitomized show don't tell, and they had their, their 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 table was covered with books. It wasn't like a blank a blank table with a guy sitting there. It was covered with books that you know you can completely go nuts and you know I, it's like wow they really have good books I mean and there's 
little to no superhero. Not that I had, not that I have nothing against superheroes, but I wanted to see something different. And you see something different with Red Five. And I, I consider Red Five the Christopher Nolan of publishers. They don't do bad books. Everything they do is great. So um, I submitted Cold to Red Five, and then uh, I I I. I, I almost fainted again when I got the email from Josh and they said, we really like Dragon Whisperer. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like great. And then and then there was a lot of back and forth, the, the business side of things. And then a year later, and, and I said, before we do any, before anything's released, I finished the entire series. And then, and then, and then March of 2020, everything was ready. We were ready to go live. I was. I had all these comic shop signings all ready to go. I had my tickets for all the conventions. March 2020. What happened around March of 2020? Mm. Yeah. So all of that went to nothing, but the comic still came out. And I'm still very happy about that. I don't. I mean, I'm sure it would have been even more successful if it had gotten in front of convention crowds. But yeah. uh, I, I don't think it, at least for in my experience for live sales and yeah. for live selling in this shop, it did not, it, it did not suffer. I had to order many times over. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy with that. So, um, uh, Joshua, how did you, how do you choose when things come into your office? How do you choose? Like when Alex, Alex's project shows up, what about Alex's project made you say this? It's kind of simple. Uh, for me, it's just, uh, it's the story, um, the story first, and then, uh, and then, and then the art. Uh, there have been a couple of books that I really, really liked the story and the writing and the, and the art wasn't quite there. And we had to say, we had to say no to it. Um, but for the, for me, for the first part, it's like, okay, who, who's the character? Um, do I like this character or interesting things happening to what's this, what's the world that this character is living in? And, uh, and then especially, um, kind of in the, in the nature of it as a medium, you can, you can get by with okay dialogue, but I, I like good dialogue. So then for me, it was also like, oh, is the, is the dialogue good? Is it, it, can I tell characters apart from each other? Does each one have a distinct personality and, and does it just reach me? And I, I kind of, uh, it's, you know, if the, the character and stories are there, that's the first thing I look for. And if they're there, uh, and I really like them, I'm, um, uh, I'm going to try and find uh, a way to make it. So, you know, I just, I read the first issue of Dragon Spur and I really liked it. So I said, I reached out back to Alex and said, oh yeah, this is good. Uh, it's really just what I, <laughs> what I think is good. If I read it, you're like, this is good. And then a couple of, I'm going to go on that. And that can be um, robots from, from, uh, from Tesla, or that can be Dragon Whisper, or it can be um, pilots coming th through a, uh, riff from the 40s you know but if i read it and i go yeah this is good then i'm like all right let's let's find something and, and i'm glad out <laughs> like, oh. and uh, and uh, i didn't realize how much he'd gone through with other publishers but i just i like it way i'm going to want to do something with it me too i'm glad i went the route that i and, went you know type of genre or type of book come you know, you know, we don't do much in superhero. Uh, it's like, it's not that I would say no to anyone who brought a superhero thing, but we, we do intentionally try not to do much in the way of superhero. But beyond that, um, you know, genre books or, or art books, it doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, it's, I'm not sitting here going like only horror books in, you know, with a vibe from the eighties or only sci-fi action adventure books, nothing against those. Cause I like those kinds of things, but I, I like, it can be, steampunk um kind of uh, all ages book with a young girl chasing after you know a dragon or it can be big strange um hallucinogenic art book from from 70s underground comics that tells a a, a weird tale of the evolution of mankind or it can be yeah fun um sci-fi cop adventure with cop in the 21st century fighting off aliens you know um, I like all of that stuff and uh so if it's something that I you know there's probably no way I can I can create it, like the di the weird Venn diagram of all the different kinds of comics I like, but I well, I'll read something and if I I like I'll know right away I like this, um, and uh, and uh, and it can be from almost anywhere. So, so I like Dragon's Provider, like yeah, got to do it. So I don't know why anybody else said no to it. <laughs> Thanks. 
So I'm a big fan of Spook, your first awesome series at Red 5. But uh, I want to know about the <laughs> box, as we've got about four yeah. more minutes. Hook them all up. All right. What's really Spook is my second series. My first series is not done. I started working on like a decade ago, and it's still not finished. But that's a, that's a longer and much, much sadder story. Um, but the box is something that um, I've been seeing in my head for almost as long as Spook has, and it's been kind of sitting there waiting for me to sit down and actually write it. And it is a, uh, it's sort of modern, my take on the modern, um, you know, film noir, private eye story set in the person, but with a, a, a supernatural twist. You have uh, this private eye, Leo Bloom, who somewhere in his tra travels, he has found that, that you can reach into it and take out uh, whatever you want out of it. Now, sometimes it, it works for him better than other times. Sometimes it gives him what it thinks he wants or what it did not necessarily have been what he wanted. And sometimes it gives him nothing. The box has very much a mind of its own, but uh, it's a, it, he uses it to crack the uncrackable cases and to uh, really make he makes his uh, a lot easier edge that makes him um, a better detective than anyone else and has people coming in knocking his door down for work. But uh, it's also um, um, a magic artifact with a lot of power uh, that's been around for a long time. And as he, he learns uh, to his dismay, there's a lot of people uh, who want it and will do anything to get it. And uh, he's got to decide whether it's worth the trouble of keeping it around and, or whether he should just get rid of it and um, get rid of that problem. The problem is that all the people who want it are very bad people. and uh, and. Uh, there's no telling what they would do with it if they had it. So it's like that.